Hey there, everybody. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of Favorite Albums Through the Decades, the show we're doing throughout the month of May, celebrating those bands that have been around for decade after decade after decade and released lots of cool albums. We've got in the co-captains chairs today, Mr. Rick Labonte from In the Prog Seat and Ryan Scow from the Hudson Valley Squares. Howdy, gentlemen. Ready to talk some of your Uriah Heap? Yes, sir. How you doing? Very cool. So uh, Heap have been around for a long, long time, and their first album was released in 1970. They have a lot of great 70s albums, a whole bunch in the 80s, a whole bunch in the 90s. They're still going strong to this day. So I'm going to have Ryan kick us off with his favorite album from 1970. Then we'll go to Rick and myself, and we'll tackle the 80s, the 90s, on and on and on we go. So Ryan, what do you got for the 70s? All right, well, I'm going to go with the first album I ever heard from them, kind of an obvious choice, but uh, I checked they, have, they had 12 albums in the 70s. Crazy. I don't know if it's a record, but that, that's got to be up there. So narrowing this down, though, this was the easiest decade for me. And uh, it's got to be this one, Humans and Wizards. Uh, I bought this. I, I was like 18, 19. I was pretty young. I was in the town of Woodstock, New York. Uh, not where the uh, concert happened in Bethel, but the actual town of Woodstock. A long time ago, I went to a random record shop, and I'm like, that kind of looks like Roger Deanard, because I did have Close to the Edge. I did have Relayers, so I knew... I was, I was young, but I knew some stuff. I picked this up based on nothing but the art, got home, threw it on the turntable. I'm like, this album is just absolutely incredible. And I've loved it ever since. Uh, I couldn't, you know, pick favorite songs on this. Rainbow Demon, The Wizard, Traveler in Time. Obviously, Easy Living was like kind of their only big hit. But uh, they, never, never, they never were like a hit span. But uh, Paradise to Spell. So this was an easy one for me going with this one. But I'll throw a quick mention because they had so many albums. And I do want to mention John Lawton. My favorite album from him from 77 was Firefly. I like it a lot. And Hanging Tree, one of the best songs they ever wrote. So oh, hey, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. Good song. So I figured I'd throw that one in there just because they had such a vast amount of albums in the 70s, different singers and all that. But uh, that's definitely my 70s choice. There you go. I can't uh, fault that one right there. Rick, how about you? What do you got? Well, you know, that he said it all. I mean, and you brought up the great album for Firefly. That's my favorite of the three that John did. Um, I always called it the Trinity. I mean, you couldn't go wrong. I was introduced to why he, uh, in this order, one evening, one guy had Demons and Wizards. I said, what else you have? And I got these albums. So any given day, these are my favorite. Uh, I would say for going today, since you mentioned this one, which was on the top of the pile, I'll go with this. Because to me, they're all draw. They all got special, unique things in each pile. But like this more heavier album, more um, closer to my Deep Purple. This showed you uh, how wonderful they are uh, sonically and a great production. And this was my introduction. So I do feel real close to this. But my favorite about all the songs here is The Magician's Birthday. I love that little story. And I love how Mick goes into a solo and a drum solo with Lee. And I got to see them do this live in 2018, uh, that song. So I'll pick this one because you mentioned Demons and Wizards. You can't go wrong. Uh, this is a fantastic album. And again, both of these albums that you mentioned feature Roger Dean's artwork, uh, which belongs to this is probably one of the proggy moments, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So anyway, great choice. I will say I own probably like seven or eight Uriah Heap shirts. I do not have a Magician's Birthday shirt. I have one of those. I got it from uh, Pete. I'll send you a link. I found a, I mean, these are bootlegs, I think, but I bought them from uh, someplace in England and it had this one and it had a black Demons and Wizards shirt. And uh, the quality is really good. Like I've worn this one a long time. Hasn't faded at all. The press is still good. So cool. Yeah, definitely do that. Cause I would like to, I have like almost, you know, a, quite a few of them. Um, I don't have this one on a shirt, but then again, I'm not crazy about the cover of this album, but you know, Rick, you talked about that Holy Trinity. Well, I'm going to go with the one we haven't talked about yet. So that's Look at Yourself from 1971. This is my favorite Uriah Heap album. Uh, I love it. It's so heavy. Uh, as much as I love both of the ones you guys mentioned, I think I like, I've always liked this one a little bit better. I love the title track. July Morning is great. Uh, Tears in My Eyes. How about Shadows of Grief? That song oh, is heavy and doomy, world. right? Oh, so good. Amazing. Love Machine is so much fun. I want to be free. I just love it. Uh, it's just yeah. so great album. I, I love this era of the band. I love this band every era. But I mean, man, these those first like six albums or so. Amazing. Perfect. Absolutely amazing, right? 
Absolutely amazing. And of course, uh, this came with two different covers, depending on whether you were in the UK or here. Uh, one cover was this, the other one had like the mirror type of thing. I don't know which one I liked the least because they both kind of suck, but but it is kind of different, right? And I guess back in the day when you bought the LP, it was like a die cut type of thing, and which mm -hmm. is kind of neat, but you know, the CD is kind of like boring, but the, the music, amazing. So that's no, it really is. Yeah, yeah. It is very good. And also uh, it, it features the... Uh, um, the slide guitar on Tears in My Eyes. It's so awesome. I love that part. And even all the harmonies and uh, it just, they carry that tradition. That was the blueprint for where they're going to move forward. Like if, if they, because Salad Bay was pretty proggy and pretty, uh, a lot of experimentation, but yeah. I think they kind of figure where they know where they are. They got their identity and they just continue building on that, I think. What have we done? If I keep that formula that they established here, I believe. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that album really kind of Salisbury, and especially that one really like set the stage for them 100%. Big, Big time. Well, let's give some credit to that first album, which is oh, great. Damn good, right? Yeah. Right. It really is. Yeah. So, all right, we move on to the 80s. What do you got, Ryan? All right. I, I think this was the easy. Uh, you know what? The 70s, I love Demons and Wizards, but they had so many albums. But from the 80s, I looked through the albums, and I think this was the easiest one for me. And, uh, I bet you're going to have the same choice, Pete. And that is 1982, Abominog, with this awesome cover that I love. And I do have a T-shirt of this cover when I bought when we saw them. Uh, I think it was in a peak skill a couple of years ago, and they played the Paramount peak skill. But yeah. uh, you know, I got Peter Golby on vocals on this one. It's a little more of an 80s transition, so they're bringing in a little more 80s. The synthesizers are less in that deep purple vein, like that heavy crunch. And they have like that sleeker modern sound, which works. Uh, a lot of songs on this album are actually covers. And uh, you know what? I didn't know that for a long time because they're more obscure covers. And the band makes, makes them work 100% as their own material. Flows very easily from song to song. But uh, Too Scared to Run, which is an original, and On the Rebound, which I believe is a cover, although I can't remember who the original is from. Uh, just awesome songs. Such good. Too Scared to Run is one of the most, I'd say one of the most metal songs they ever wrote. That's like just pure early 80s heavy metal. Of course, they got Leaker Slate came back on this. He was gone for a little while. And they got Bob Daisley. So they basically, you know, ended up with both of the guys coming back from Ozzy's band at this point. And, uh, yeah, I just love this album. Love the T-shirt. Love the art. Iconic. You know, I think this sits up there with uh, Born Again by Sabbath. Is that kind of that red, awesome early 80s cover art that's just, you know, like, oh, it's kind of ugly. Like, nah, that's really cool. I think it's an awesome looking uh, design. Yep. So. That was the easiest decade for me going with this one. You know, they had some good albums in the 80s, uh, not as good as the 70s. But I think this one kind of stands head over shoulders. I as my favorite. Yeah. I'm going to Pomodoc. And there are people who hate that album cover. I think it's awesome. I, I, I saw that in the stores. I'm like, yep, auto buy. Thank you. Yeah, it's like Born Again. People don't hate it. I'm like, no, no, no. That's awesome art. I love it. <laughs> it <laughs> no, you got a Born Again cover, too. A Melody Maker, a USK, a UK uh, magazine, voted it the ugliest cover. Uh, of that year, but it got more popularity in there. Same thing with the number of the beats. It only helped them because people say, well, let's see of what they're course. talking about. Yeah, it, good it gets publicity you or bad publicity, sometimes good publicity in this case. I agree. So I concur. I, I thought this was the, 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 the album of the 80s. However, I'd like to mention a couple of things. One, you know, it was um, a crossroad for uh, uh, Mick to be able to pick up his pieces together. He did go to David Byron, try to see if he can get his old uh, flame back. Uh, that didn't work out. And But what a comeback to do so. And I would also argue that he did it twice in that decade because these guys didn't last forever. They put a couple albums and then he did it again with another dream team, Raising Silence, where you end up picking the pieces again. New singer, new, uh, you know, we've got an old bass player back but a new keyboard player and almost another dream team. This album is very close. I mean, I like this album a lot. It's very it important. It, it could have been there, but then it, the material is very strong in this album. And then also they were wave, they were on the, the wave of the new a wave of British uh, metal, right? The heavy metal. They they jump on that. Say, hey, man, we started this trend. We know how to do this. And they did a very good job. So this is very good timing. Uh, so this album felt to me, it was better time for them to put out and get a momentum. Whereas this album, uh, for 89, maybe outdated, but it's for that period, or maybe it's very um, modern at the time, but a very good songs here. 
I just like the cast of characters that Bernie Shaw has become. Like, I've, I've followed him a lot more than, let's say, Peter Goldberg. But, I mean, you did have Bob Daisy on here. You do have Lee back on the drum kit. So it's an excellent album. And so I like, the, I like the cover that they did. And I find it interesting that on this album, they put a cover on here, too. Uh, if you get the CD, you get Hold Your Heads Up from uh, Argent. Argent, where they did the, um, the, the cover from Small Faces on this album. It's my choice too, uh, obviously. And uh, I, I bought this when it came out. Love every song on it. I like the covers, even the kind of more commercial sounding stuff on here are great. I mean, uh, Running All Night with the Lion is just awesome. Uh, Hot Persuasion, good heavy song. Sell Your Soul is really heavy. There's some really heavy stuff on here. I think Think It Over is tremendous. And of course, Think It Over was written by their previous singer, John Sloman, was supposed to be on the Conquest. Well, it was supposed to be on the album that came after Conquest, which obviously never happened because that band kind of imploded from within. But they kept the song and then Peter Goldie sang it and did a great job on it. I, I like, I don't mind the fact that this album is kind of slick in spots, but it's still a pretty fairly heavy album. Uh, you know, and if you were a fan of the new wave of British heavy metal at the time, like Rick was talking about, and you were into bands like Demon or Praying Mantis, right? Not that different. Really not that no. different. It's just really no, it's right in there. Commercial hard rock, right? I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. So and the harmonies, like the way it is, oh, and all amazing. these choruses, yeah. they're so they're so memorable. You turn off the CD, and the chorus is still contained, carrying on in your head. It's so catchy. <clears throat> yep, absolutely. All right, we move on to the '90s now. Ryan, what do you got? All right, so I'm going with the uh, obviously Roger Dean did the iconic art to uh, Demons and Wizards, and he did Magician's Birthday, and he did a third album by them, which is 1995's Sea of Light. And it, it's a little more uh, yes looking art here by Roger, but uh, this is a great album. And uh, you know what? I liked 91's A uh, uh, Different World a uh, bit, but I thought it was it's not one of my favorite Heap albums. Bernie sounds good, but to me, this album really kind of brought back the early 70s. Uh, heap sound like I like some of the changes they had gone through over the years obviously you know starting in the late 70s especially with Abominog things changed you know the lineup constantly changed but this album really kind of solidified like their return to like that classic heavy organ crunch which uh, they in my opinion they've stayed with till today they haven't released a million albums since then only a handful but like just really brought it back 100% uh, the opening track against the odds sorry against yeah, against the odds amazing dream on time of revelation uh awesome you know and uh was a drummer so this did have yeah i had to check on this because sometimes i get the drummer a little bit mixed up but this had, did have lead he just played on this one i think he had this and he did sort sonic origami and that was his final album with the band but uh those drumming on this is great so this is uh to me this is kind of like classic old school heat you know the songs are awesome uh i don't know i listen to this one all the time and whenever we see them live today and they throw a couple songs in here I think on the last tour they, they did uh against the odds that was fucking awesome you know i think it was the most recent tour i'm not always the best at remembering which songs a band plays on what tour you know some some friends of mine are awesome at that like oh yeah iron maiden played but, but, but you know in 2003 it's just a big mush in my head but uh yeah i do like when they bring stuff out from this album and it is one of my favorite heap albums overall you know i think they only released those three albums in the 90s if i'm correct but uh yes so, yeah yeah well, uh, it I was think kind of like they, the last thing. I'm like, this is Sonic because I like that one a lot. Sonic is very strong also. Yeah, I it agree. Is. It is a good mm -hmm. album. But, uh, I, think I think the shows that I saw, uh, and I think you were at every one I was at, I think they played Words in the Distance in like, one of those songs. That that mm -hmm. does challenge. You know, thank, thank God for websites that catalog this stuff. Yes. Yeah. My memory oh, sucks. I mean, there's so many songs, right? It's like, but I, I, I think Words in the Distance was played at least one of the New York shows that we saw in that for that yeah. year span or whatever you know the pick between this and sonic origami uh kind of almost came down to the artwork because i just love that roger dean artwork. <laughs> yeah. the cool logo we did for them yeah it's just really really freaking cool so uh yep going with sea of light 1995 yeah, wow great mind thinking like because i'm the same position i i feel the same thing i mean they're neck to neck the artwork and some of the songs are just a couple more songs i like stronger I mean, this is a great production, great album. The whole album's awesome. But this is the one that I, I go to. And, you know, uh, when I saw, like, I collect all the DVDs too, right? And all the live DVDs. 
And uh, and they uh, when they play this live, I'm just as excited as them doing the David Byron stuff. Cause seeing them pull this stuff live, so awesome. And vocally, uh, Bernie is really on top of his game. He really is the unsung hero uh, for a singer. That's kind of funny saying that. No pun intended, but he really shined on this. You know, and, uh, and I think the songwriting great, and it just feels like a real, real fan out. But um, the album before that, between the w different world, whatever, it's, it was a lot of Trevor Boulder's music. It was like just guys helping out whoever wrote the song. It feels like a band album to me. That's what I like about that. That's my choice as well. Everything you guys said, a lot of really solid songs. It's just getting back to doing what these guys really do best. And uh, I love the lineup, you know, got Trevor Boulder, may he rest in peace, you know, great bass player on here. You got Lee, you got Phil, you got Bernie and Mick. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, a really, really strong album with some great artwork. And uh, yeah, that's to me, edges out Sonic or Origami by a little, by a little bit. All right, we only got so uh, we got uh, one album in the uh 2000s, so I think we know what everybody's picking here, right? <laughs> Wait, uh, yep. I mean, this is a, it's a great album, though. It's a really it's good album, powerful. I love it. What a way, eh? I mean, you think you're willing to bring something new to the table? They did, it's powerful. It's, uh, it's a great formula to tell you. I mean, Russell Gilbert is our uh, first presence on this album, wasn't it? This is where he comes in. It yep. really shines, and, and he's on, and he's still on the drum show today. But uh, but wow, what a powerhouse to bring to the table and just make those songs sound so. I think they sound younger. Yeah, because it's so, they do. so much power, you know. They do. The, uh, the the opening track, the two opening tracks, uh, "Wake the Sleeper" and uh, "Overload." That's like two of my favorite like Uriah Heep songs ever. And that transition, it's almost like Priest going from like. Uh, you know, the Hellion to Electric Eye, like it builds up, builds up. Like when I heard this, I'm like, man, that guy's just I'm like annihilating like the double pedal, the whole song, that whole intro just does not let up. So I'm like, this, this new drummer is phenomenal. Yeah, and like you said, he's, he's awesome. still with him today. Russell's an amazing drummer. So he definitely filled Lee's shoes, you know, rest in peace, Lee. But, uh, you know, it, this, it, it does. They sound rejuvenated. They sound young, uh, full of energy, uh, just amazing. So this, yeah, this is a great album, even though it's the only one they did in that decade but i think uh any other thing they would have released would have, it would have had to compete against a, a very fine album you know yeah this is this was a great comeback album and uh it was one of my favorites of the year and i still really like it a lot it's uh if it's not my favorite of all the albums that came out after the or with this and after it's number two because i think i think my next pick is might be my favorite but this is just great and it's a good heavy supercharged album and like rick said they sound like they're 20 years younger than they actually were right i mean it just it, they sound like a young hungry band and yeah it it's do. a lot of muscle and that power chord that's for sure yeah it's very heavy yeah all right ryan your favorite of the 2010s and on well it's uh funny you mentioned sounding lively because when we saw them uh you know i've seen them a couple of times in recent years and they're always a 10 out of 10 live band but a couple of years ago i'm pete and myself saw them up in albany new york with opening for judas priest and uh you know i, I don't know people's opinions on newer judas priest i thought the last album was good i thought they put on a great live show but i tell you what for my money Uriah Heep came out, and I guess because they knew they were opening for like you know a heavier band, uh, you know, and Priest, and Priest was going to bring a powerful set. Heep just came out and just nuked the place. Like they, it was just nonstop energy, like a 19-year-old band, insane. So uh, I want to pick this album because I love all three of the albums from the 2010s, but the newest one is my favorite. Uh, I freaking love this album. It is just heavy as hell. There's so much energy on it. It's amazing that this band's first album was 1970. And in, uh, what was this, 2018? Yeah, 2018, they're putting out an album that's got as much piss and vinegar as this one. And you see them live and they 100% sell it. Like there's no like mucking around. There's no slow parts. It's loud as hell. It's intense. It's fast. It's heavy. They just, they just blow you off the stage, you know? And uh, Priest were good, but I thought he really stole that show. They brought their A-plus game. And, and uh, the songs from this album too, Raised by Heaven, Living the Dream. I mean, every song is good on this. It's just, I, there's nothing I skip. There's no songs. I'm like, ah, I'm going to play that one over and over again. I just play the whole thing through. Rocks in the Road, you know, that crunchy, heavy keyboards. Uh, Russell's drums are insane. 
Mick sounds great. Bernie sounds great on vocals. So, yep, I thought all three were good, but Living the Dream is definitely my favorite of the newer bunch of albums from them. And one thing that needs to be mentioned about that night, they played a couple tracks from this album that went over just as well with the crowd as all the old. Oh, yeah. Yep, and because they didn't, they didn't slow down. Like, okay, we're going to play an old song, a new song. They just you know, played they did, like, Yeah, here's something from Demons and Wizards. They don't even stop. You know, the guitar's still feeding back. Here's a new song, you know, like just blazed right through them. You know, almost like a thrash metal band, like just absolutely no break, no really talking to the crowd, just total energy. In fact, I was awesome, you know, for a band Great. that's been around this long to like have that kind of like intensity. Oh, I love that. I had a big, stupid, shitty grin on my face that whole set <laughs> watching it. <laughs> I, you know, I was, I was spending time with them backstage after their set and I, I said that to them. I was like, wow, you guys just kind of rampage through that set. And Mick was like, well, we only got an hour, man. We got to do, we got to squeeze everything in we can. And, you know, I can only hope that we can come back and, and everybody seems to be getting into it. Maybe we can come back and headline this place, you know, and the crowd was totally into it and they were happy as anything. They're like, we're, we're just thankful to be on this tour and, you know, reaching the, this audience. And yeah, it was, it was great. Great show. I know many times when we hear a band play something live, they tell, they always bring a lot more beef and power to uh, taking what was on the studio and bring it to the stage. But when you listen to this album, it is as powerful as you hear it on stage. It is, they got it recorded as if you were, you know, playing live with the Marshalls back, um, you know, uh, you know, bigger than the stage itself, um, because that was what they tapped it on this record. You know, when I saw them in 2018, they were touring this album, okay? And I thought, you know, they do this song, this song really good live. And when they do something like Gypsy or, um, you know, uh, any of the classics, they put some muscle into it. They, they put, Russell definitely put his presence known. But when you do this album, neck to neck to all those covers, they were so strong live on, in the set list because it's so well done. And yeah, this was my choice too. I do think, though, I'd like to give note to the audience to say, hey, these are good albums, folks. Oh, yeah. These are awesome they're albums. They're like, really good. You wouldn't go wrong getting these. And, of course, you can see they autographed that. And, of course, they style this one, too. But these guys, this is, like, an amazing album. I, I love every song of it. And I got to see them headline in Ohio. I got to see them uh, in the U.K. again doing this album. Uh, well, the main set list, and they didn't play song from here. They focused mostly on this and the classic, and no one complained because they love this song. Like you said, Ryan, is equally as hearing something of the classic because it's so well received and because it's so much muscle. I also like to give a little bit of notice to um, the, well, it's his second album with Davy Wimmer. He's a bass player, and he helped. He, you know, being a new guy, new kid in a block, he sort of got a chance to contribute. And the very, you know, big hit, the video, Great by Heaven, is written by him and uh, Jeff Scott Soto. Well, that's great uh, to see that he could bring a song to the table and the band embrace it like they did. Uh, but the whole album got everybody. Bernie got his fingerprints on a few songs here, wrote them lyrics and stuff. So it really is another great album for them. And everybody's personality is coming through full throttle. They're firing at all cylinders and uh, living a dream. To record this must have been living a dream for the new cats in the band to say, wow, we're making history. Because a lot of times uh, when you have a legacy band, they think how much of the past was their prime or that was the, you know, that was the, uh, the swan song, the ultimate moment. But they still got cats in the tank and approved that. And I believe the way the momentum is the next album is going to be just as powerful because they know how to deliver. Absolutely. I, I can't wait for whatever they're doing next because I'm sure, it, I think they're already kind of planning to do something. By, uh, I recall like one of Mick saying online, but uh, yeah, whatever it is, it's, you know, the first day it comes out, just going to buy it without even listening because you know it's going to be good. Guaranteed. Right. Yeah, they've got, I don't remember because, God, I talked to Mick about that last year. I don't remember when they said it would be ready, but I think late this year, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know. I'd have to go back and, and double check, but that would be great if we get a new Heap album before. Oh, yeah. Well, I've been conversing with uh, uh, with Davey and Russell because they're playing on my album yep. and they have time. That's the only advantage that I could have. Wow, you're not touring. They agreed to play uh, drums and bass on a couple of my tracks and I just got them today. 
the big hour that Pete invited us to uh, have a, a chat and talk about UI Heap, who also gave me the drum track. And from my understanding, the fall is what their game plan is. But they don't, you know, I don't think a lot of bands are sitting on the music unless they can tour. They don't want to just throw it out there and then be, well, that's the thing. you know, get forgotten. Yeah, they want to make sure they can uh, push it because when they went on tour with this, that helped the sales. I'm sure of it. Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Yep. Well, it was my choice as well. No surprise there. Uh, great album, top to bottom. Just amazing. One of my favorites of the year when it came out. Um, yeah. And it's, uh, I, I'm just, to me, the fact that this band has a handful of great albums so late in their career that match up with some of their best stuff is pretty cool, I think. Um, and it's just a testament to a great, great band that's given us a lot of great music and they continue to do so. So. We'll that is long live it. your right heap because they long live your right heap. Yes. They're not living on the past, they're still delivering it as the present. Yep. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks everybody for watching. Uh, in the comments below, please put your favorite Uriah Heap albums by the decades, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s. Got a lot to choose from here. And uh, look at that. He's got his coffee mug as well. So I think Rick has a coffee mug for every occasion, I think. <laughs> That's right. So I want to thank uh, Ryan and Rick for joining us here today. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube. All the damn, All time. The damn All time. time. That is right. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, tune in later on for more programming for Rick Labonte and Ryan Scow. I am Pete Pardo. Take care. Take care, everybody. <laughs>